I'm Elizabeth Zadrowski. I'm a Florida um, media specialist in Palm Beach County at a high school, Glade Central High School. And I'm also the president of FAME, which is the Florida Association for Media and Education, which is a professional organization for school librarians and ed tech leaders in the state of Florida. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. So are you, did you do any sessions here or any poster sessions or anything like that? Yeah, I actually um, conducted a session yesterday with some of my colleagues called Make It Specialists. Um, talking about uh, maker spaces in libraries at the elementary, middle, and high school levels and how we make those work in our schools because every school is different and as your clientele is different, your maker space will look different. Yes. yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I just noticed there were some, some students over here with padcasters and, and, and iPads doing some, some cool media stuff right over there by the window. We actually have a padcaster. Yeah, right? yeah, that's yes. awesome. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we saw yeah. their booth here earlier this week. When yeah, we yeah. The, 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 the. So, um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think that's a very key piece of makerspace rollout, makerspace development. Not one size fits all. Right. right? You have to know what your students do, what they like, what you have to know what the school wants. So just talk a little bit more about some of those things. So there's a lot of, you know, buzzwords when you think of makerspaces. 3D printing, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not for every school. Right. Um, First of all, the cost. Uh, the cost at first can be a lot, although they've gone down a lot, but not everybody even has the ability to spend $400. And, and you can get them for $400 that are fairly nice now, but maybe you don't even have that. Right. And so you can start with something as simple as, for example, my elementary colleague took um, big juice boxes and wrapped them up and she created a big, huge size Jenga. And so the, the students, they were challenged to make things with these Jenga juice boxes. She also did the 100 cup challenge with red solo cups and they, they had to build anything except a pyramid. You could use, um, you, know, you could use popsicle sticks. I, and I had students at my school, I said, okay, you have 20 minutes and 100 popsicle sticks. Tell me what you can do. And I had them make, uh, one of them made me a business card holder. And it now holds my business cards on my circulation desk. Yeah. So uh, sometimes maybe because of lack of technology, lack of time, especially in a library, it's not always as well staffed as we'd like and you can't be in 50 places at once. Um, sometimes you can do things that aren't maybe one of the more popular tools or devices that's out there. Not everybody has to do programming. Not everybody has to do an Arduino or a Makey Makey. But you need, the important part is for them to be thinking critically, and if you can incorporate some technology there, they can do whatever they're doing in a cooler way. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. That, that is awesome. That is very, very cool. So, one of the things that, that we've talked about um, in terms of makerspace, it, it's so funny, you know, today it's called makerspace. When, when we were in school, and possibly, you know, where, where you guys were in school, when you were in school, it was, um, I think they called it things like wood shop, <laughs> home ec, and you know, that kind of, you know, like, yeah, we had that, but you know, it, it was definitely, it was, and it's, it, it was definitely not what it has become. Right. And I think that's so important. I, I love, you're talking about these, you know, low tech, almost no tech types of makerspace. Mm -hmm. Because people instantly think, oh, I'm gonna have to buy all this, and we're gonna have to do all this. No, not necessarily. You know, yeah, it makes you think. Kevin Honeycutt always posts stuff like a cardboard DeLorean. Love him. You know, yes. all that kind of stuff. He's actually going to be our keynote for our Fame Conference in October. Oh, he's a awesome. very good friend of yes. ours. Very good. We spend a lot of time oh, with him. Maybe you guys need can, to come to Fame. Maybe we need ah. to come to Fame. You might need to come and do we'll have to talk after. We'll, we'll yes. Talk after. Okay. okay. I'll have my people call your people. You <laughs> Wait, we, we are. That would be perfect. <laughs> I actually have people. There you uh, go. Uh, hey, you're better than us. We can yeah, have people too. It's called these my people. <laughs> you know, that's what we were. That's a big thing that's been we were talking about here yeah. earlier with uh, with a fellow Arkansan this stop by Mickey, who's a blogger uh, here for this and a tech integration specialist at Springdale Schools in uh, Arkansas. And they've done, they've gone to one to one real heavily, and that's one of the largest school districts. That's probably the largest school district in Arkansas. And they've finally gone one to one, and they're now jumping into the maker space. Now we have East Labs. Uh, which was East was started in Arkansas uh, years ago, uh, probably 15, 20 years ago, as the Environmental Satellite Technology Labs. But 
uh, what they are where there was a facilitator and the kids were allowed to come up with projects that they would work on and, and you know and that's what they do it could be we're gonna map all the fire hydrants in the city or we're gonna you know build care packages for this it was you know that kind of thing and, and, and we were talking about maker spaces and you're so right people go well that's just they're just gonna print 3d toys that's all they're gonna do and and in this kind of conference and the things that you do are helping people realize oh okay these are the avenues we can do uh, we had a great conversation with a group yesterday that won a stem award here and uh, they um, they uh, collaborated with the US patent office in their makerspace wow. so they could teach the kids about copyright and about you know, mm. patent, about the law and wow you know I see where you won the stem award that's really cool yeah. and, and they did it the right way and, and you know there's so many different makerspaces going on that pretty soon I think you'll we'll start to see you know a, a name and makerspace put together like a blank makerspace mm -hmm. and and we'll start to see those happen what, do, do you feel that way I mean are you excited about that kind of change I am excited but I also see a huge connection between makerspaces and problem-based learning mm -hmm. um, which you know going back to some of the early Apple ed stuff yeah. you know we talked a lot about problem-based learning but with all of the testing and you know people are constantly under pressure to perform you know on assessments mm -hmm. they've backed away from some of that problem and project-based learning but you could incorporate that now that you know everybody's really excited about steam and stem and right. and maker spaces you know you could take a real-life problem and have the students solve it mm -hmm. and you know they could use Tinkercad to design something to solve an issue and what we were talking about last night with Howard de Blasi, um, who you guys probably know, the yeah. you know Imagineer mm -hmm. guy, yeah. he uh, was was talking about wouldn't it be interesting if we went and found problems that Disney Imagineers have had to solve, and then presented those to our students, and figured out how our students would solve them now with the technology we have right. before we shared with them how they were actually yeah. solved. Yeah. So, you know, I could see, you know, using AutoCAD or Tinkercad, you yeah. know, you could you could even build things in Minecraft, you know, talking right. about, okay, we have to move this lake from here to here. We have to move the Dumbo ride from here to here. Right. How would you do this? How would you restructure it? Oh, yeah. You know, because now they're learning things that they're going to take with them into the workforce because yeah. that's what you're really going to be doing. How many right. problems do we solve in a day? Yeah. Yeah. And, exactly. and so they need to learn those skills. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. Well, and I love the idea of, of tying it into those real world, like, you know, Disney type issues. You know, one of the first things that popped in my head was in the in the way old days, you know, if you watch those old Disney movies and, and they show that depth of field where, you know, certain mountains are going by faster than other mountains because how far away they were, or how close they are, all that. You know, and, and the way they achieved that back then because of the, Technology, or what a lot of us today would say, the lack of technology. There's always technologies, it's how you use it and what you're doing with it, but and it changes. But what they had available to them in terms of making that stuff move versus what students have today. So I love the idea of giving the students this problem. Hey, this is what we want to happen in this particular movie scene. How would you make that happen with the tools you have available today? And then show them, oh, yeah, back then they didn't have that, they had to have cut out glass <laughs> on moving boards, whoops, on moving boards, and they had to have people that were actually moving the boards, you know, I mean, and, and just show them, hey, this is what happens. I, I think, so I think that's the interesting part is that well, you're right about assessment, you know, it's a lot of assessment. Yeah. And, and finding that way to put it in the Makerspace Lab so that, okay, I'm going to cover this entire standard yeah. right here, yeah. you know, math, literacy, whatever I have to do so I can address what they're going to be tested on in this project and can I do it in two weeks? Can I do it in a week? Because there's that next part. How, how can I get as much in there but still give us time inside that maker lab to do our project, to hit that problem? That, that's I would like to see who's doing that. And you know, and somebody, there's a great thing, who's gonna compile that? I think that's the biggest thing we've learned. It's so funny, we say Kevin Honeycutt to you and you know them. And we, we had a, another guest that's a big time music guy that writes songs with kids and stuff like that didn't know Kevin never heard of Kevin but you know it just shows how big our industry is in education right. and that's the thing that happens is that this school does this awesome thing and maybe the schools around it hear about it 
but the rest of us never know. And it should change. And, and there's a great part of, yeah, it should. With social media, you know. It's, it's starting to happen, Twitter especially. I love the fact that more educators have realized that Twitter is exactly the one of the best ways for us to do it. Yeah. And that's actually the theme of our next FAME conference is tell your story, your library's fantastic journey. Yeah. Because very often, even the really great innovative librarians operate in a bubble. Right. And then people don't know what they're doing. And so that stereotype of, you know, the librarian with the bun in her hair and 10 cats, right. it, it's perpetuated. And if right. you're a principal and you've only seen one kind of librarian and they weren't effective, then when it's time to do the budget at your next school, you might say, eh, we don't need one of those. Right. But the thing is, when you lo when you have a crappy guidance counselor, you don't get rid of the guidance department. Right. right. When you have a stinky math teacher, you don't say, ah, screw math. We're not going right. to do that. Right. So we need people to understand that library media specialists are a part of this puzzle. Yes. And in order to do that, we have to tell our story. We can't operate in a bubble. Right. No, that's exactly right. We, and that's what we do. That's why we do live conference for education, is that we want to hear the ed tech journeys. We want to hear their ed tech stories. And that's why LRP invited us to come to FETC to do this. And we, we do it in a lot of places. And, and this is really important. And that actually trickles down. When you can get an educator to understand the importance of their story, and they can hear themselves telling it, and we can, you know, we can discuss it with them and have a great time doing it, then they realize how important student stories are. And then they realize the entire world that we're creating right there. And that it has really nothing to do with anything but communication and telling a story. And I think that's a very key role in what librarians, air quotes, media specialists, media specialists. You know, as that position has evolved, helping students learn how to communicate that message yeah. out what's good behavior, what's correctable behavior, you know, that type of thing, what's good, bad, and ugly to post online. Um, but it's been very interesting to me for those folks who are in that library media specialist role, um, especially the ones like you that, you know, you, you see the changing nature of media in general, and I'm gonna argue that I think part of it is kind of what you said, in terms of districts who look at you know library media and go up, oh, yep, we don't need that. So part of it, I think, is self-preservation. You know, how do I keep my job? Right. And it's amazing to me. It really is amazing to me how many media specialists have been grabbing onto the makerspace as a way to show, hey, this is what I can offer you. This is why you need to keep me here because look what your kids are doing. Well, and it's a perfect thing for me as somebody who works at a school where you know, 87, 86% of my kids are not on level reading wise. Mm -hmm. So I immediately have a majority of reluctant readers. So some of those students come from the middle school level and they don't want to set foot in the library. Right. So if I have other things to pull them in, maybe the first day they come in, all they do is hang out and eat lunch. But maybe right. the second day they play with the Osmo. Right. Maybe the third day they, you know, look at the scratch coding books. Yeah. It, and maybe by the time they've been there three or four weeks, maybe I can finally get them to check out one of my Florida Teens Read books because we've developed a relationship and I know what they're interested in. And, oh, there's this guy in this book that I think you'd love. And all of a sudden, this kid that never would have even stepped foot in the library is a regular and is yes. there every single right. stinking day. Right. <laughs> well, you want them there or not? Yeah. Oh, I always want them there, though. I, I like, I'm pathetic. I miss them when I'm gone. But... But, you know, that's, that's another thing you have to think about is how do you reach your population? Because my population looks way different than where Lee teaches. Yeah. You know, she teaches at a private school with extremely privileged students, but she yeah. used to teach with me. Yeah. So she's seen that difference and how you, it's not a one size fits all, whether you're yeah. talking about a library, a makerspace, or an English classroom. Right. So I'm late, by that. the way. Yeah. <laughs> she, she was trying to be quiet. I told them when we started we were going to eventually get her on. So. so one piece that's really important is Lee was one of my main collaborators when we worked together at Glade Central. And 
I saw how effective that relationship can be between a library media specialist and a classroom teacher and how we were able to engage the students and do really cool things like cranium core competitions between two classes. Yeah. Oh, and it got ugly too. That's what I was going to say. So from, from the teacher side, oh, the it got side, ugly. Yeah. They were writing notes back and forth and the teachers were delivering them. I was just as guilty. We were, we were helping them come up with insults that were high level vocabulary. Nice. We open the door and just hurl them into the classroom and run. Oh, great. it was it was ugly for about a week. And when you think of the fact that it's technology that allowed those kids to be engaged like that, we're talking very reluctant readers, a hundred percent engagement in two classes where an assistant principal or principal could walk in the room and every single kid was participating. You don't get that in no. an inner city school. When ours is an inner city rural, it's very interesting. It's like you drop the projects in the middle of a sugarcane field. So it's a really unique wow. place. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you don't get that kind of engagement during reading activities. It doesn't happen. Right. But because of the competition piece and the technology piece, using game-based learning and, co and Cranium Core, yeah. they're in it. I mean, they loved it. And then we engaged with the author over Twitter. I mean, it was great. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Man. So something we like to do here uh, is called the 45 second uh, elevator pitch. So you get on an elevator with your hero and you've got 45 seconds to sell yourself and sell your program and sell your project, tell them who you are. And you've got just that short ride to whatever next floor they're gonna get off. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> the exits. Does this hero have money to give me for my school? It could be whatever. It could be Deborah. Let's go with that. Let's, yes. let's do it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Yes. This person, this, your hero has money that they could possibly give you if they okay. understood. They're going to make it rain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's right. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, we're on. We're on audio. If you could, you could have seen the video for that. And if my students could have seen me doing that. Oh my gosh. That Benjamin's is great. everywhere. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ready? Okay. So I'm on an elevator with Steve Jobs. Of course, he isn't dead at this point. <laughs> it's not funny. Okay. So, Mr. Jobs, I want you to know that I've used your technology to enhance the lives of my students and that my students are the kind of kids that people don't want to work with because they don't understand how amazing they are. They don't see what I see when their eyes light up, when they get to accomplish something, when they get to tell their story using iMovie, when they are able to design something using animation-ish and a bamboo pad, but we don't have enough money or resources or staff to do right by my students and they deserve better. So I want you to know that my kids are amazing, the best kids I have ever met in the world, and that I will work so hard to make it worth it if you would help provide us with the resources we need for my babies to be successful in the world. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's, awesome. That's a sound bite. That's awesome. Okay. That's really good. <laughs> That's really good. Um, can I get your picture? Sure. Great. Sure. Uh, Somewhere can can I mean, we talked about Twitter, so people reach you on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. All I, right. So what's your what's your Twitter handle? It's at the Z 